Manchester United finally got their goal yesterday after seven hours in a brilliant comeback versus Aston Villa, where Ten Hag made some tactical changes at half time, which we're going to dive into in today's video when we talk about five things we learned from Manchester United 3, Villa 2, Garnacho, Mayno, Bruno. We'll dive into their performances and what worked so well. But before we get into the five things we learned and talk about the Villa game, it's time we talk about the Manchester United takeover. More information has come out about rules that have been set in place, rules to stop the Glazers taking out dividends, rules in case the Glazers want a full sell. Some really interesting information. So we're going to get into that. And then, of course, some things that Bruno has said on the takeover. So please do smash that like button if you have not already. And of course, subscribe down below. I do apologise if the signal cuts out once or twice. My Wi-Fi is just broken at the moment, so I'm actually recording on like 4G. So uh, hopefully this comes out OK. So before we get into the five things we learned, let's dive into the stories. So it was said by Fabrizio Romano and many other sources by Romano and any, many other sources that Man United must consult Ineos on every player transfer whilst their investment is being approved by Premier League authorities. That essentially means if Manchester United want to buy someone in January, they've got to consult Ineos. So maybe if they say we want to buy Werner, Ineos are like, no. Maybe if they say we want to sign Twanabo, Ineos are like, yes. Maybe if they say we want to sign Bakayoko, who we've been linked to and I will talk about in tonight's live stream, maybe they'll say yes, which is good because maybe that will stop us doing some silly deal for Donny Marlon or Werner and actually start looking at long-term players. We've been linked to PSB right winger Bakayoko. I will talk about that in this evening's live stream and I will dive into this information in more detail in this evening's live stream because there's so much to get into and I just want to get into five things we learned, but just cover the three main stories. It was then said by James Ducker, there will be no dividend payments at Manchester United for at least three years under the term of Ratcliffe's deal with the Glazers. Boom! Yeah! I mean, look, that's, that's the biggest positive so far. Glazers cannot take dividends out for three years. They cannot take money out of the club for three years. And Ratcliffe's going to invest money into the club for the next three years. Ratcliffe's going to get support and control. Well, I'm very very, very much been full sale, full sale, full sale owner, and I would stick with that stance. The fact that Ratcliffe is coming in, investing his own money, and the Glazers won't be able to take dividends out, I think is a positive, and gives me the sense that the priorities might actually finally be on, actually, let's get us back to where we need to be on the pitch before we start using United to make money out of, which is what we need. I mean, we should be using Man United to make money out of in the first place, but you know what I mean. But the interesting thing that was said, and this is sparked a few rumours, is under the so-called drag along rights, Sir Jim Ratcliffe would be forced to sell his shares subject to him receiving £26 per share cash offer from the Glazers should they decide on a full sale in 18 months from now. So there's rumours and suggestions. Could the full sale still be on? Could the Qatar deal still be on? All of that kind of stuff. Now, to be honest, I, I think that this is probably something that won't be activated. And I think eventually Sir Jim will buy out the Glazers. Obviously, there's no guarantee Sir Jim buys out the Glazers, which is the most worrying thing about this takeover deal. It's like, OK, Ratcliffe's coming in. He's getting sport and control. Dividends aren't coming out. Maybe a new stadium's happening. That's good. But the Glazers are still here. You're enabling the Glazers to be here. and There's no guarantee they will leave, which is the big negative about the Ratcliffe situation. But it is said, and I. But it is said that basically, the, the Glazers decide on a full sale. Jim Ratcliffe might have to step aside, and and they maybe could sell to Qatar, and we could get that full sale. I do think if the Glazers decided on a full sale, I think Ratcliffe would get first priority. I assume if they decide on a full sale, Ratcliffe would be doing the full sale uh, because I know that he gets first priority rather than like them going, yeah, sorry Ratcliffe, thanks for the money, we're now going to sell to Qatar, bish bash bosh, out you go. Here, thanks. You know, I don't think Ratcliffe's stupid enough to come into United and invest like 300 million and then kick him out for Qatar. Uh, but there is a suggestion that the Glazers could very much be sort of open to the full sale in future, which is what we need. So they are the three new takeover rules. Ineos must improve investment, no dividends for three years. And obviously, if the Glazers decide to sell, Jim Ratcliffe is forced to sell his shares. Three positive rules coming in there. And I think the most important thing Ineos can do is now invest into the team, invest into the stadium and make the priority getting Man United where it needs to be on the pitch over making money commercially. Bruno Fernandes was asked about the United takeover and he said it's not going to change anything on the pitch apart uh, part, um, unless they come in and bring in some new players, they put some money in for the club, they can make a difference. But apart from that, it's us going on the pitch. Um, Bruno's saying, you know, we're the ones that can change things on the pitch. We need to do better. But obviously, if Ineos can put some money in, that would be absolutely great. I think it's essentially what Bruno is saying. Now we're going to dive into the five things we've learned from Aston Villa part of the video, which is the video I'm most excited to record because there's quite a lot of information I want to dive into. And I'm really just hoping this video comes out all right and it's not got lag spikes and stuff. And so I do apologise if it does, but it's... Just, 
I, I think like my Wi Fi has just taken a week off for Christmas. It's been so bad. I'm surprised I could do a watch along yesterday. But the first thing we learned is Man United played the best players in their best position, and it makes a massive difference. One of the most frustrating things this season has been Ten Hag playing Rashford at strike or a right wing to accommodate Garnacho at left wing or or um, so, someone else at left wing. And while I think Garnacho is a great player, when Rashford's the more experienced and Rashford we know can't play right wing, you stick Rashford on the left wing because he was our best player on the left wing last season. You say, Garnacho, you play right. Now, Garnacho's in a much better season than Rashford, so you could say, well, maybe Garnacho should be starting on the left and Rashford should be on the right. But Rashford, who was our best attacker last season, should not be moved out of position to accommodate an 18-year-old, as much as I love Garnacho. But the more the one that was more infuriating than Rashford at right wing and striker was Bruno playing right wing, which we just know, know doesn't work, to accommodate McTominay, Mount, whoever he was playing in midfield. Or when we were moving Bruno into centre mid, moving Bruno into deeper areas, deeper roles to accommodate McTominay. This Bruno basically playing today proved why we need to stop this McTominay 10 obsession because Bruno was brilliant. And Ten Hag played his best players in their best positions and look how much better we were. That was the best starting eleven that Ten Hag could literally line up today out of all the players available. There was no Luke Shaw, there was no Amrabat, there was no Casemiro, there's no Martinez, there's no Maguire, there's none of that. That was the best starting eleven. You could argue, no, that was the best starting eleven that Ten Hag could have lined up today with the players available. No doubt in my mind. There was no one on the bench that I thought should be starting. That was the best starting eleven, and he played all of them in their in their best positions. You play our best starting eleven in their best positions, and we look so much better. And I want to talk about Garnacho, who was man in the match. He consistently just drove at the opposition. He created opportunities for himself. He put a few good crosses in, but the end product wasn't quite there. Hoyland couldn't get on the end of it. Ericsson left it. Garnacho was making things happen. Anthony gets the ball on the right hand side. And it's the one-footed merchant that's really predictable, but Anthony's work rate is good, but it's like he doesn't do anything. It feels like nothing ever happens from that right-hand side, but Garnacho playing the right-hand side and he's creating chances for himself. And I think he's had quite an underrated season. I think his work rate has been one of the things that hasn't been spoken about this season. It's really improved. I think Garnacho gets his head down. He works really hard for the team. He can shoot, he can dribble, we can run at people, we can make things happen. Garnacho is our second best winger. Currently right now, our best winger in form after Rashford. Um, so second best winger after Rashford, currently our best winger in form. He is better player than Anthony. Stick him on the right hand side. He makes things happen. He's direct. I love Garnacho. But I want to talk about number three that we learned from the game. Third thing we learned is a balanced midfield unlocks Bruno. Wow. Bruno was the first player to play five plus three balls in a single Premier League game since De Bruyne over a year ago. But what was interesting and what the United Faithfuls mentioned here is Ericsson next to Mena made such a massive difference. Control, progression, chances and also allowed Bruno to operate effectively as a 10. Hope 10 keeps this going forward um, or Amrabat with um, McTominay coming off the bench. McTominay coming off the bench is good. McTominay as a starter, not good. Amrabat in games where it's going to be a bit more intense and defensively we could be in trouble ahead of Ericsson, good. Obviously Casemiro coming in ahead, next to Mena would be brilliant. But we'll talk about Mena in, in a second and how good he is. Um, but I think, you know, Ericsson and Maino can retain the ball well. That allowed Bruno to get further forward. Although Ericsson was higher than Bruno at some point, it allowed Bruno to get into the final third. And because we had the midfield that could retain the ball well, we actually got the ball to Bruno in good positions. And Bruno was allowed to create. Bruno was allowed to cook. Bruno had an absolutely phenomenal game. I was super, super impressed with Bruno Fernandes, which brings me into the fourth thing we learned, because what did Ten Hag change at high, half time that made such a difference, some of you may be asking, and that is the press, and I will dive into this in more detail in my live stream, I will explain this to you and get some examples and, and analysis on it if you want, but essentially Ten Hag said this at half time, he said, we conceded two goals from silly set plays, but we weren't that bad in the first half, but what we did in the second half is changed our pressing, and what that means is instead of four players running around half pressing, which is so easy for Villa to pray through, it was the fullbacks committed to the press there were six players high intense press and Man United are only able to seem to do this press for 45 minutes or the odd game here and there and I don't know if it's because of the high intensity or Ten Hag doesn't tell them to do that or the work rate of the players I don't know what it is but when every single player actually committed to the press and it was a true high press but everyone committed it worked and it caused Villa problems we caused Villa to make mistakes in their own half which we capitalised on a lot. And I thought Bruno Fernandes playing in that 10 role as well really helped with the press. So I thought Rashford pressed well, we've got actually pressed well, Hoyland pressed well, the fullbacks did a good job. But I want to talk about the fifth and final thing, Kobe Maino and the youth. Kobe Maino was excellent today. Kobe Maino was like a future captain energy. 
Kobe Maino is 18, Garnacho is 19, Willie Campbell is 19, Dan Gore's 19, and Medjbury is 20. That's five very young youth players all involved in today's comeback. And Maino and Garnacho were probably the two most integral to that. They were the two best players in the Youth Cup final. I remember doing a watch along to that a year and a half ago, and they were brilliant. Kobe Maino, and people don't realise this, is he is playing for the biggest club in England who is in a really bad period with bad players around him where it's it's really hard to come into a club that is playing poorly, that has a poor energy, that's got a poor and unsustainable system and play so well. Like if you're a youth player, if you go into Man City where everything's sustainable and you get moulded in, it's a lot easier than coming into United when things are a mess. He's playing in that sixth role that Casemiro struggled in, Amrabat struggled in, McTominay can't even play in on his own multiple games and he's been absolutely fine. It's not looked a bit out of place. The sixth role on his own, he's not even a natural six. He's he's actually a natural eight or he could play as a six in a hybrid role. He's playing in that sixth role on his own against Villa, a very good team, and he is fine. He made one little mistake versus West Ham, but he was good versus West Ham. He was good versus Newcastle. He was good versus Everton. He was good versus Liverpool. He's playing in all these top games and he has been good. He doesn't look out of place. He's 18. He looks so mature. He looks so ready. This guy is so good. Anyway, please do hit that like button. Of course, subscribe down below if you're new. Thank you for watching. My five things we learned. See you next time. Bye.